The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so today we're going to briefly review classical sequencing and uh, next-gen or second-gen sequencing, um, which sort of provides a lot of the data that um, uh, the analytical methods we'll be talking about uh, work on. And uh, we'll then introduce uh, local alignment, sort of a la, a la BLAST, and some of the statistics uh, associated, uh, associated with that. Uh, so just a, a few uh, brief items on uh, topic one. All right, uh, so today we're going to uh, talk about sequencing first, uh, conventional or Sanger sequencing, then uh, next-gen or second-gen sequencing um, briefly, um, and, then, and then talk about local, uh, local alignment. So background for uh, this lecture, well, for the sequencing part, the Metzger review covers everything you'll need, and for the uh, alignment, we'll talk about local alignment today, global alignment um, Tuesday, then um, chapters four and five of the text uh, cover it pretty well. So here's, here's the text. If you, wanna, if you haven't decided whether to get it or not, you can, I'll have it up here. You can uh, come flip, flip through it uh, after class. Okay, so um, sequencing is mostly done at the level of uh, DNA, uh, whether you know, the original material was, was RNA um, and uh, uh, or not, usually convert to DNA and sequence at the DNA level. So we'll often think about DNA as sort of a, a string, uh, but it's important to remember that it actually has um, a, a three-dimensional structure, um, as, as shown here. Um, and uh, often uh, it's helpful to think of it in sort of a, a two-dimensional representation where you think about the, uh, the bases and their uh, hydrogen bonding and so forth, as shown, uh, as shown in the middle. My mouse is not working today for some reason, but hopefully won't, hopefully won't need it. Um, so uh, the, the chemistry of sequencing is very closely related to the chemistry of, uh, of, the, of the individual bases. And there are really you know, three, three main types that are, uh, are going to be relevant here. Um, so ribonucleotides, deoxyribonucleotides, and then uh, for uh, Sanger sequencing, dideoxyribonucleotides. So, who can tell me which of these structures corresponds to which of those names? And also, please um, let me know yeah, uh, your, your name, and I'll attempt to <laughs> remember uh, some of your names uh, toward the end of the semester, probably. So which are which? Are which? Uh, yes, what's your name? Okay, so, so, that, so that is correct. So uh, one way to keep these things in mind um, is uh, the numbering of the bases. So uh, the carbons in, in the ribose sugar are numbered uh, one. So carbon one is the one that, where the base is attached. Uh, two is here, uh, which has an OH in RNA and just an H in DNA. And then three is very important, uh, four and then five. Um, so Five connects to the phosphates, which then you know, will connect the base to the, to the back, sugar phosphate backbone. And uh, three is where, you, uh, is where you extend. Okay, that's where you're going to add uh, the next base in a growing chain. And so what will happen if you give DNA polymerase um, a template and some dideoxynucleotides? It won't be able to extend because there's no 3 prime OH, okay, and all the chemistry requires, uh, requires the OH. And so that's the basis of uh, classical or, or, or Sanger sequencing, uh, which um, Fred Sanger got the Nobel Prize for in 1980, so I think it was developed in, in the 70s. And it's really the basis of most of the sequencing, or pretty much all the DNA sequencing up until the early uh, 2000s before some newer uh, technologies uh, came about. And it takes advantage of this special property of dideoxynucleotides that they terminate uh, the growing chain. Okay. So imagine we have a template DNA. So this is the molecule whose sequence we want uh, to determine, shown there in black. 
we then have a primer. Okay, notice the primer is written in five prime to three prime uh, direction. The ends would be sequences, uh, you know, primer sequences and then primer complementary sequences um, in the template. So you typically will have your template cloned, this is in conventional sequencing, cloned into some uh, vector, like a, a phage vector uh, for sequencing, so you know the flanking sequences. And then you do four sequencing reactions in conventional uh, Sanger sequencing. And I know some of you have probably um, had this before. So let's take the first uh, chemical reaction, the one here with the DDGTP, okay? So what would you put in that reaction? What are all the components of that reaction if you wanted to do conventional sequencing on, say, an acrylamide gel? Anyone? What do you, what do you need? And what does it accomplish? Um, yeah, what's your name? I'm Tim. Tim, yeah. Oh, I don't need Tim. <laughs> okay, go ahead. You need the four nucleotides. Um, the nucleotides, you need only mm -hmm. Okay. In addition, you need you know, all the other components. You need the polymerase, generally you need buffer, some sort of easing, you need template. Primer. Yeah, primer, primer template. template. Yeah. Great. Great. That, that, that's good. It sounds like um, Tim could actually do this experiment. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, if you put in, um, uh, okay, so you put in, and what, what, what ratio would you put in? So, you said you're going to put in all four. <laughs> conventional deoxynucleotides, and then one dideoxynucleotide. So let's say dideoxy G, just for simplicity here, okay? Uh, so in what ratio would you, would you put the dideoxynucleotide con compared to the conventional nucleotides? The lower concentration. Lower? Like how much lower? Like maybe 1%? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, you, you want to put it a lot lower, okay? And why, do you want, why is that so important? Because you want the change. Right, right. So if you put equimolar deoxy G and dideoxy G, then it's going to be a 50% chance of terminating every time you hit a C in the template, right? And so you're going to have half as much of, of material at the second G and a quarter as much at the third, and, and it's, you're going to have vanishingly small um, amounts. So you're only going to be able to sequence the first few uh, Cs in the, in the template, right? Um, exactly. So that's, that's a very good point. Okay, so, so in that mix, uh, yeah, so now let's imagine you do these, you do these four separate reactions. You typically would have like radio labeled primer, okay, so you can see your DNA. And then you would run it on some sort of gel. This is obviously not a real gel, but a uh, idealized uh, version. And then um, in the lane where you put dideoxy G, you would see the smallest product. So you read these guys from the bottom um, up. And in this lane, uh, there is a very small uh, product that's just one base longer. Uh, than, than the primer here, and that's because there was a C there and it, and it terminated there. And then the next C appears uh, several bases later, so you, you have a sort of a gap here. Um, and you can see, so you can see that the first base uh, in the template would be the complement of G or, or, or C, and the second base would be, uh, it would be nice if I had a, yeah, my mouse disappeared. Um, anyway, the second base would be, you can see, uh, the next smallest product in this dideoxy T lane, therefore would A, and you just sort of, you know, snake your way up. Uh, through the gel and read out the sequence, okay? And this um, works well. Uh, so what does it actually look like uh, in, in practice? Uh, here are some actual uh, sequencing gels. So you run, uh, you run four lanes and um, on big, used to be big uh, polyacrylamide gels like, like this. Torben, you ever run one of these? Yes. yes. They're, love, you know, big pain to, to cast, run for several hours, I think. And you get these, these banding patterns. Um, and what happens, um, you know, what, what limits the sequence uh, read length? So we normally call the sort of the sequence generated from one run of a, of a sequencer as, as a read. So the, you know, one attempt to sequence the template is, is, call, is called a read. And you can see it's relatively easy to read the sequence, you know, toward the, toward the bottom. And then it gets harder as you go up. Um, and so that's really what fundamentally limits the read length is that the, the bands get closer and closer together, right? So the, 
they'll run proportional to size with, or inversely proportional to size with the small ones running, running faster. But then, you know, the difference between a 20 base product and a 21 might be significant, but the difference between a, a 500 base product and a 501 base product is, is going to be very small. And so you basically can't, you can't order the, um, the, the lanes anymore, and therefore that's sort of what, what, what fundamentally limits it. All right, so what's, um, so here we had to do, um, run four lanes of a gel. Can anyone think of a, a more efficient way of doing Sanger sequencing? Is there any way to do it in one lane? Um, yeah, what's your name? Pages? Yeah. So you can use four different types of the MPPs, maybe like four different colors. Four different colors. Okay, so you put, instead of using radio labeling on the primer, you use uh, fluorophore on your um, dideoxy NTPs, for example. And then you can run them, they'll each one, uh, depending where, where that um, strand terminated, it'll be, it'll be a different color, and you can run them all in one lane. Okay, and so that looks like that. Okay, and so this was uh, an important uh, development called <coughs> dye terminator sequencing uh, in the 90s to the present, and that was the basis of um, the ABI 3700 machine which was really the, like the workhorse of uh, genome sequencing in the late 90s and early 2000s, really what enabled the human genome uh, to be sequenced. And so one of the other innovations in this technology was that instead of having a big gel, they, they shrunk the gel, okay? And then they just had a reader at the bottom. So the gel was shrunk to um, as thin as these little uh, capillaries. So I don't know if you can see these guys, but, but basically it's like a little Looks like a little thread here. And so each one of these is effectively, oops. Oh no, it, no, no worries, this is not, not valuable. Um, ancient, ancient technology <laughs> that I got for free from somebody at Broad, I think. And so um, the, 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 uh, the DNA would be loaded at the top. It would run, there would be a little gel in each of these. Uh, it's called capillary uh, sequencing. And then it would uh, run out the bottom and there would be a detector which would detect the four different uh, floors and read out, uh, read out the sequence. Okay, so this, this basically condensed uh, the, the, the volume needed uh, for sequencing. Okay. Um, all right. Any questions about conventional sequencing? Yes? Where are the NTPs? Would you put the fluorescent flags, like to stop it from affecting the reaction? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't actually, I don't, I don't remember. There, there, I think there are different, different options. Uh, available. You, and sometimes uh, with some of these reactions, you need to, to use um, modified uh, polymerases that will, you know, that can tolerate these, these modified uh, nucleotides. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember that. That's a good question. I can look that up. Um, so how long can a conventional sequencer go? What's the read length? Anyone know? Ballpark. It's about, say, 600 or so. Um, and so that's, that's reasonably long. Right? How long is a, is a typical mammalian mRNA? Maybe two, three KB. So you have, in a typical exon, maybe 150 bases or so, so you have a chunk. You don't generally get full-length cDNA, but you get a chunk of a cDNA that's, say, three, four exons uh, in length. And that is actually sufficient to, it's generally sufficient to uniquely identify the gene locus that that read uh, came from. And so that was the basis of EST sequencing, so-called express uh, sequence tag sequencing, and millions of these, you know, 600 base chunks of cDNA were, were generated, and they're uh, quite useful, uh, have been quite useful over, uh, over the years. Okay. All right, so what is uh, next-gen sequencing? So in next-gen sequencing, you, um, you only read uh, one base at a time, so it's actually a little bit, perhaps, well, yeah, it's often a little bit slower. Um, but it's really massively parallel, and that's the big, uh, the big advantage. And it's orders of magnitude cheaper uh, per base than uh, conventional sequencing. Like when it first came out, it was maybe two orders of magnitude cheaper, and now it's probably, you know, I don't know, another four orders of magnitude. So, um, so it really um, blows away conventional sequencing if your um, the output that you care about is mostly proportional to number of bases sequenced. Okay. If the output is proportional to the, the, the quality of the assembly or something, then you know, there, there are applications where conventional sequencing still has, um, you know, is, is very useful, but uh, because the next-gen sequencing tends to be shorter. But in terms of just volume, it's, it's, it's much, much, um, uh, generates much, much more bases in one, 
uh, and one reaction. And so the basic ideas are that you have your template DNA molecules. Now, typically, tens of thousands for technologies like PacBio or hundreds of millions for technologies like, like Illumina uh, that are immobilized on uh, some sort of uh, surface, typically a flow cell. And there are either single molecule methods where you have a single molecule of your template, or there are methods that locally amplify uh, your template and produce, say, hundreds of, of copy, identical copies in little clusters. And then you use modified nucleotides, often with fluorophores attached, to um, interrogate the, the next base um, at each of your template molecules, okay, for hundreds of, hundreds of millions of them. Okay, and so uh, there, there are several different technologies. We won't talk about all of them. We'll just talk about um, two or three that are, that are interesting and widely used. Um, and they differ depending on the DNA template, what types of modified nucleotides are used, and to some extent in the imaging and the image analysis, which differs for single molecule methods, for example, uh, compared to uh, the, the ones that, that, have, that sequence a cluster. All right, so there's a table in the Metzger uh, review. And um, so I've just told you that, that like, next-gen sequencing is so cheap, but then you see like, how much these machines cost, right? And they, you could buy lots of other interesting things with that, you know, that, kind of, uh, that kind of money. Um, and I also want to emphasize that that's not even the full cost. So if you were to buy um, an Illumina GA2, this would be like a couple of years ago when the GA2 was the state of the art, um, for half a million dollars, the reagents to run that thing, if you're going to run it you know, continuously throughout the year, the reagents to run it would, uh, would be over a million. Okay, so it's actually, <laughs> this, this actually underestimates the cost. Um, however, the cost per base is, is super, super low, because okay, they generate uh, so, much, uh, so much data at, at once. All right, so we'll talk about uh, a couple of these. So uh, the first next-gen sequencing technology to be uh, published and still uh, used today uh, was from uh, 454, now Roche. Um, and it was based on what's called emulsion PCR. So they have these little beads. The little beads have um, adapter DNA molecules um, covalently attached. You incubate the beads um, with DNA, and you actually make an emulsion. So the emulsion, it's an oil water emulsion. So each bead, which is hydrophilic, is in a little bubble of water inside oil. And the reason for that is so that uh, you, you do it at a template concentration that's low enough that only a single molecule of template is associated with each bead. Okay, so uh, the oil then provides a barrier so that you know, the DNA can't um, get transferred from, from one bead to another. So that each bead will have a unique uh, template molecule. You do sort of a local PCR-like reaction to amplify uh, that DNA molecule on the bead. And then you do sequencing uh, one base at a time um, using uh, a luciferase-based method that I'll, I'll show on the next uh, slide. Okay, so Illumina technology differs in that instead of an emulsion, you're doing it on the surface of a flow cell. Okay, again, you start with a single molecule of template. You have your flow cell has these two types of adapters covalently attached. The uh, template anneals uh, to one of these adapters. You extend uh, the adapter molecule with uh, DNTPs and polymerase. Now you have the uh, complement of your template. You denature. Now you have the inverse complement of your template molecule covalently attached to the cell surface. And then at the other end, there's the other adapter. And so what you can do is what's called bridge amplification, where that now complement of the template molecule will, um, will bridge over, hybridize to the other adapter, and then you can extend that adapter and now you've, you've regenerated your original template. So now you have the complementary strand and the original strand. You denature. And then each of those molecules can undergo uh, subsequent rounds of bridge amplification to make clusters of uh, several, typically several hundred a thousand molecules. Okay. Is, that, is that clear? Uh, question. Yeah, what's your name? Stephanie. Yeah, um, go ahead. My question is, how do they get the adapters when they're turning how do you get the, the adapters onto the template <laughs> molecules? Okay, so that's typically by uh, DNA ligation. Um, so we may um, we may cover that in, in later uh, later steps. It, it it depends. There's a few different protocols. So for example, if you're sequencing microRNAs, you typically would use 
isolate the small RNAs and use RNA ligation to, to get the adapters on, and then you do an RT, an RT step to get DNA. With um, most other applications like RNA-seq or genome sequencing, uh, so with RNA-seq, you're starting from mRNA, you typically will isolate total RNA, do poly A selection, you fragment your RNA to reduce the effects of secondary structure, you random prime with like random hexamers, RT enzyme, so that'll make little, little bits of cDNA 200 bases long, you do second strand synthesis, now you have double stranded uh, cDNA fragments, and then there's, you, can, you do like blunt end, blunt end ligation to, to add the adapters, and then you denature so you have single strand. Is that? that the two ends are different. Yeah, yeah, okay, that, that's, uh, that, that's a good question. So there are, um, um, well, I'll post some stuff about library. Yeah, I don't, I don't wanna, it's, it's, a good, it's, a very, it's a good question. I don't wanna like sweep it under the rug, but, but um, I, I, kinda wanna, I kinda wanna move on and, it's, and I'll uh, post a little bit about, about that. All right, so, so we did 454, Illumina. Helicose is sort of like Illumina sequencing except um, single molecule. So you, you have your, your template uh, covalently attached to your, your substrate. You just anneal primer and just start, start sequencing it. Okay. Um, and uh, there's, there's major pros and cons of, of single molecule sequencing, um, which, we can, which we can talk about. And then uh, the PAC biotechnology is fundamentally different in that the template is not actually covalently attached to the surface the DNA polymerase is covalently attached to the surface, and the template is sort of threaded into the uh, polymerase, and this is a uh, phage polymerase that's highly processive and, and strand displacing, and the template is often a circ circular molecule, and so you can actually read um, around the, the, uh, the template uh, multiple times, which turns out to be really useful in PacBio because the error rate is, is, is quite high for the sequencing. So in in the top, in the 454, you're measuring luciferase activity, light. In Illumina, you're measuring fluorescence, four different fluorescent tags, sort of like the four different tags we saw in Sanger sequencing. Helicose, it's single uh, tag, one base at a time. And in PacBio, you actually have a fluorescently labeled um, DNTP that has the label on, it's actually um, hexaphosphate. It's got the label on the sixth phosphate, okay? So, the DNTP is labeled, it enters the active site of the DNA polymerase, and the residence time is much longer if the base is actually gonna get incorporated into that growing chain. And so you measure how much time do you have a fluorescent signal, and if it's long, that means that that base must have incorporated into, into the DNA. Um, but then the um, extension reaction itself will cleave off the last five phosphates and the and the fluorophor tag, and so you'll, you'll regenerate um, native DNA. Okay, so that, that's another, another difference. Whereas in Illumina sequencing, as we'll see, there's this reversible terminator chemistry, so the DNA is not native that you're, that you're synthesizing. Okay. All right, so this is a little bit more on uh, 454, just some uh, pretty pictures. I think I uh, described that uh, before. The key um, chemistry here is that you you add one DNTP at a time, okay, so only a subset of the wells, perhaps a quarter of them, that have that, that next base, the complementary base free, you know, as, as the next one after the primer, uh, will, um, will undergo synthesis, and when they undergo synthesis, you release pyrophosphate, okay, and they have these enzymes attached to these little microbeads, the orange beads, sulfurylase and luciferase, that use pyrophosphate to basically generate light, and so then you look uh, you have one of these beads in each well. You look which, um, which wells lit up when we added DCTP, and they must have had G as the next base, and, and, and so forth. And there's no termination here. The only termination is because you're only adding one base at a time. So if you have a single G in the template, you'll add one base. But if you have two Gs in the template, you'll add two Cs, okay? And in principle, you'll get twice as much light. But then you have to sort of do some analysis after the fact to say, okay, how much light do we have and was that 1G, 2G, and so forth. And, and it's, the amount of light is supposed to be linear um, up to about five or six um, Gs, but that's still a more error-prone step. Um, and the most common type of error in 454 is, um, uh, is actually um, you know, insertions and deletions, whereas in Illumina sequencing, it's, it's, it's substitutions. Okay. 
uh, David actually encouraged me to talk more about um, sequencing uh, errors and quality scores, and I need to do a little bit more background, but I may, may add that um, a little bit uh, later uh, in the semester. Um, okay, so in Illumina sequencing, you, you add all four DNTPs at the same time, but they're, they're non-native. They have two major modifications. So one is that they're three prime blocked. That means that the OH is not free. I'll show the chemical structure in a moment. So you can't extend more than one base. You incorporate that one base, and the polymerase um, can't do anything more. And they're also tagged with four different floors. Okay? So you add all four DNTPs at once. You let the polymerase um, incorporate them. And then you image the whole flow cell okay, using two lasers and two filters, so basically to, to image the four floors. So you sort of take four, uh, four different pictures of each portion of the flow cell, and then the camera moves and you scan the whole, uh, the whole cell. And so then those clusters that where, uh, you know, that incorporated a C, let's say, they will show up in the green channel as a spots, and those incorporated in A, and so forth. So you basically, you have these clusters, each of them represents a distinct template, um, and you read one base at a time. So you first you read the, the first base after the primer, so it's sequencing like downwards um, into the template, and you read the first base so you know what the first base of all your clusters is, and then you reverse the termination. Okay, you cleave off that chemical group that was blocking the three primer OH, so now it can extend again, and then you add the four DNTPs again, do another round of extension, and then image again, uh, and so forth. And so it takes a little while. So each round of imaging takes about an hour. So if you want to do, you know, 100 base single end Illumina sequencing, it'll be running on the machine for about four days or so. Uh, plus the time you have to, you know, to build the clusters, which might be uh, several hours like, like the day before. Okay. All right, so what is this? Uh, so actually, the, the, the whole idea of blocking termination, basically Sanger's idea is, you know, is carried over here uh, in a luminous sequencing with a little twist, and that's that you can reverse uh, the termination. So you could, if you look down here at the bottom, these are two different um, three prime terminators. Remember your base counting, uh, base one, two, three. So this is three prime, was the three prime OH. Now it's got this methyl azid or whatever that is. Not much of a chemist, so you can look that one up. Um, and then here's, an, uh, here's another version. And so there's chemistry that can, you know, that can cleave this off uh, when you're done. And then this whole thing here, hanging off the base, is, uh, is the floor, okay? And you cleave that off as well, okay? So you add this big complicated thing, you image it, and then you cleave off the floor and cleave off the, the three prime uh, blocker. All right, these are some actual sequencing images you would image in the, in the, four, uh, the four channels. They, they're actually black and white. These are like, you know, pseudo colored. Uh, and then you can, uh, you, you can merge those and you can see then all the clusters on the flow cell. So this is from a GA2 with the recommended cluster density back in the day, like a few years ago. And nowadays, the image analysis software has gotten a lot better, so you can actually load the clusters more, more densely and therefore get more sequence out of one, out of the same, you know, as the same area. Okay, but imagine just millions and millions of these little uh, clusters like this. Notice the clusters are not all the same size, right? So some DNA molecule, basically you're doing PCR and C2, and so some molecules are easier to um, amplify by PCR than others, and that probably accounts for these variations in size. Okay. All right, so how, what is the, the current throughput? So these, uh, these are data are accurate as of about maybe last year. Uh, so a HiSeq 2000 instrument is sort of the, the most you know, high performance, widely used uh, instrument. Now there's a 2500, but I think it's roughly similar. You have one flow cell. So a flow cell looks sort of like a glass slide, except that it has these sort of tunnels carved in it like eight little, little tubes uh, inside the glass slide. And on the surfaces uh, is where, uh, of those tubes is where the adapters um, are, are, are covalently uh, attached. And so you have eight lanes. So you can sequence um, eight different things in those eight lanes. You could do, you know, uh, yeast genome in one and fly RNA-seq in another and so forth. Um, and these days, a single lane uh, will produce something like 200 million reads. And this is typically, I mean, this is like, it's routine to get 200 million reads uh, from a lane. Sometimes you can get more. Um, you can do up to 100 bases. You can do 150 these days on a MySeq, which is a miniature version. You can do uh, maybe 300 or more. Um, 
And so that's, that's a whole lot of sequence. Okay, so that's 160 billion bases of sequence from, from a single lane. Okay? And that will cost you, that single lane, maybe you know, two to $3,000, depending you know, where you're doing it. Uh, and the cost is mostly, uh, that doesn't include the capital cost, that's just the reagent uh, cost uh, for running that. So 160 billion, that's now, you know, the human genome is, is 3 billion, right? So you've now sequenced the human genome over um, many, many times there. And that's not, you know, you, you, can do, you can do more. So you can do paired end sequencing where you sequence both ends of your template uh, and that'll basically double the amount of sequence you get. Um, and you can also, this machine can do two flow cells at once. So you can actually double it uh, beyond that. And so for many applications, 160 billion bases is more, is overkill, is more than you need. Imagine you're doing bacterial genome sequencing. Bacterial genome might be five megabases or so, right? This is complete overkill. So you can, you can do barcoding where you add a little six base tag, uh, different six base tags to different um, libraries and then mix them together, introduce them to the machine, sequence the tags first or second, um, and then sequence the, the templates. And then you uh, effectively sort of sort them out later and, uh, and then do you know, many samples in one, in one lane. And that's what people uh, most, commonly, most commonly do. Okay, so questions about the next gen sequencing. There's a lot more to learn. I'm happy to talk about it more. It's very relevant to this class, um, but I'm sure it'll come up uh, later in, the, in David's section, so I don't want to take too much time on it. Okay. Okay, so now we're, once you generate uh, reads from an Illumina instrument or some other instrument, uh, you want to align them to the genome to determine, for example, if you're doing RNA seq. Uh, mapping, you know, reads that come from mRNA, you want to know what genes uh, that they came from. So you need to map those reads uh, back to the genome. Um, what are some other reasons you might want to align uh, sequences? Just in general, why is aligning sequences, meaning matching them up and finding bases that, uh, individual bases or amino acid residues that match? Why is that, why is that useful? Uh, Diego? Uh, you can assemble them? Yeah, so if you're doing genome sequencing, if you align them to each other and you find a whole stack that sort of align, you know, this way, you can then assemble and make a, make a longer, infer the existence of a longer sequence. That's a good uh, point. Yes, um, in your name? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, looking at homologs? Looking at homologs, right. So if you, for example, have, are doing disease gene mapping, you've identified a human gene of unknown function uh, that's associated with a uh, disease then you might want to search it against, say, the mouse uh, database and find a homolog in mouse, and then that might be what you would want to, um, you know, to study further. You might want to then knock it out in the mouse or, or mutate it or, or something like that. Okay, so that's, um, those are some, some good reasons. There's, uh, there's others. Um, so we're going to first talk about local alignment, which is a type of alignment where you want to find shorter stretches of high similarity, okay, and you don't require alignment of the entire sequence. Okay. Um, so there are certain, you know, certain situations where you might want to do that. So here's, here's an example. Um, you're studying a recently discovered human non-coding RNA. As you can see, it's 45 bases. You want to see if there's a mouse homolog. You run it through NCBI BLAST, which as we said is sort of the Google search engine of, of bioinformatics. And, and, you, and you're and you gonna get a chance to do it on problem set one, and you get a hit that looks like this, okay? So notice, this is sort of a blast notation. It says Q at the top. Q is for query, that's the sequence you put in. S is subject, that's the, the database you were searching against. You have coordinates, so one to 45, and then in the subject, it happened to be, you know, base 403 to 447 in some mouse chromosome or something. And you can see that it's got some matching, um, but it also has some mismatches. So in all, there are 40 matches and, and five mismatches in the alignment. So is that significant? Would you, remember the mouse genome is, is 2.7 billion bases long, right? It's big. So would you get you know, a match this good by chance? Um, so the question is really, would, should, you, should you trust this? Is, this? is this something you can confidently say, yes, mouse has a homolog and that's it? Or should you be like, well, that's not better than I get by chance, so I, you know, I have no evidence of anything, or is it sort of somewhere in between? And how would you, how would you tell? 
Um, yeah, uh, what's your name? Chris. Yeah, go ahead. So you would want to figure out some sort of like squaring function for the alignment. Okay. And then with that squaring function, you find uh, whether or not the significance of that would match that. Okay, so Chris says you want to define a scoring system and then use the scoring system to define statistical significance. Okay, can you, do you want to suggest a scoring system? What's the simplest one you can think of? Just um, if there's a match, you add a certain score. If it's a, if it's a mismatch, you subtract a certain score. Okay. Yeah. So let, let's do that. Let's do that scoring system. So, and the simplest would be. Um, so the notation that's often used is S I I. So that would be a match between nucleotide I and then another copy of nucleotide I. We'll call that one plus one for, for match. Okay. And Sij, where i and j are different, will give that a negative score, minus 1. Okay? So this is i not equal to j. Okay, so this is actually, that's, that's a scoring matrix, right? It's a 4 by 4 matrix with 1 on the diagonal and minus 1 uh, everywhere else. Okay? Um, and this is, this is commonly used for DNA. And then there's a few other variations on this that are also, uh, that, that are also used. Okay. So good. So a scoring system. So then how are we going to do the statistics? Any ideas? How do we know what's significant? Yeah. But the scale is not. Yeah, it's not so obvious. Um, yeah. Uh, question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a good idea. So you could actually, uh, I mean, BLAST, it turns out, it's pretty fast. So you could, you could shuffle your RNA molecule, randomly permute the nucleotides uh, many times, maybe even like 1,000 times, search each one against the mouse genome, and get a distribution of what's the best score, you know, the top score uh, that you get against the genome. Look at that distribution and say whether the score of the actual one is you know, significantly higher than that distribution or just falls in the middle of that somewhere. And th that's, that's reasonable. Okay. So it turns out, I mean, you can certainly do that, and it's, it's not a bad thing to do. Uh, but it turns out there is an analytical theory here that you can that you can use, and so that you can sort of determine significance more quickly without doing so much, um, you know, uh, so much computation. Okay, and that's what we'll talk about. Okay, but another issue before we get to the statistics is how do you actually find that alignment? How do you find the top scoring match in the mouse genome? Okay, so let's suppose this this guy is your your RNA. Okay, of course, I mean we're using T's, but you know that's just because you usually sequence the at, at the DNA level, but it, imagine it's, this is your RNA. It's, it's very short. This is like 10 or so, I think. Um, and this is your, your database. Okay, but it, it goes on, you know, you know, a few billion more than, you know, <laughs> several more blackboards. Um, and I want to know, uh, I want to come up with an algorithm that will find the highest scoring segment of this query sequence against this uh, database. Any, any idea? So this will be like our first algorithm, and it's, it's not terribly hard, so um, that's why it's a good one to start with. Not totally obvious either. Who can, who can think of an algorithm or something, some operation that we can do on this sequence compared to this sequence in some way that will help us find the highest scoring match? You have to, you have to consider I'm, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, so we're going to keep it simple. That, that's true in general, but um, we're going to keep it simple and just say no insertions and deletions. Okay, so we're going to look for an ungapped local alignment. Okay? So that's, that's the algorithm I want. Um, first, no, no gaps, and then we'll do gaps uh, on Tuesday. Uh, Tim? You can just compare your 10 sequence squares with all across the uh, database and count out. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, pretty much. So that's that's um, more. I mean, that's pretty much right. Um, although it's not quite as much of a description as you would need uh, if you wanted to actually code that. Like, how would you actually do that? So I want a description that would uh, is sort of more at the level of like pseudocode. Like, here's how you would actually organize your code. Okay. So 
let me just start by doing, let's say you, you, you sort of entertain the hypothesis that the alignment, the alignment, it can be in different like registers, right? It can be, the alignment can correspond to base one of the query and base one of, of the subject, right? Or it could be, it could be shifted. It could be an alignment where base one of the query matches base two and, and so forth, right? So there's sort of different, different registers. So let's just consider one register first, okay? The one where base one matches. Okay, so let's just look at the, the matches between um, corresponding bases, okay? I'm just gonna make these little angle bracket guys here. Hopefully, won't make any mistakes. Um, okay, I'm gonna take this. This is sort of implementing Tim's idea here. And then I'm gonna look for each of these. So consider like going down here. Now we're sort of looking at uh, an alignment here. Is this a match or a mismatch? Okay, that's a mismatch. That's a match. That's a mismatch. That's a mismatch. That's a match. 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 Um, mismatch, mismatch, mismatch. Okay? So where is the top scoring um, match between the query and the subject? Tim. Anyone? Six, seven, eight. Six, seven, eight. Good. Uh, oh. Five, six, seven. Five, six, seven. <laughs> right, right, right here, right? You can see there's three in a row. Um, okay. How do we know, well, what about this? Why can't we add this to the match? What's the reason why it's not two, three, four, five, six, seven? Because the score for that is lower. Because the score for that is lower, right? We defined top scoring segment. You sum up the scores across the match. So you can't, you can't have mismatches in there, but the, you know, in order to go, this will have a score of three, right? Um, and in order, if you wanted to add these three bases, you would be adding um, negative two and plus one, so it would be, it would re re reduce your score, so that'd be worse, okay? Any ideas on how to sort of do this in an automatic, algorithmic way? Yeah, uh, what's your name? Yeah. Okay, so, so you keep, you keep like shifting it over and you generate one of these lines, okay. And now, but imagine my query was like, you know, a thousand or something, okay. And my database is like a billion. Um, um, what, what, I, I'm this gonna, I mean, how do I look along here? And, and here it was obvious what the top square match is, but you know, I mean, if I had, if I had two matches here, right, then it would have been, we would have actually had a longer, longer match here, right? So how do I, um, um, in general, how do I find that, that top match? I've, for, each, for each of those, each of those registers, if you will, you'll have uh, a thousand, you know, you'll have a thousand long a diagonal here with ones and minus ones on it. What do I, how do I process those scores to get, to find the top scoring segment? What's an algorithm to do that? It may seem, I mean, it's, it's kind of like intuitively obvious, but I want you to do something with like a variable, you define a variable and you update it and you add to it and subtract, I mean, something like that that it, like a computer could actually handle. Um, yeah, uh, what was your name? Ju Ju Julianne, yeah. Okay, you keep track of what the highest total score was. So, yeah. the highest, um, highest score. The highest um, segment, like right. segment score. Okay, so let's define. Okay, I'm going to put this up here, and okay, we'll define max s. That's the highest segment score we've achieved to date, and we'll initialize that to zero. Let's say okay. Um, because if you had all mismatches, it would be, zero would be the, the correct answer, right? If, if your query was A's and your subject was T's, right? Um, and, okay, and then, and then what do you do? Um, you go down this diagonal. Yeah. Keep track of. Keep track of what? Um, so you go like, what, you look at one and one first, and find out the score of one and one. 
Yeah. Yeah. But the score of the maximum segment at that point, after base 2, is not 0. It's actually 1, right? Because you could have a segment of one base alignment, right? The cumulative score is 0. The cumulative score may also, you're, I mean, I think you're onto something here. That may be also something useful to keep track of. Okay, so what would, let, let's, let's do the cumulative score, and then, you, and then you tell me more. OK, so we'll define cumulative score variable. We'll initialize that to 0. And then we'll, do, we'll have some for loops that, um, as some of you have said, you, know, you want to you loop through the subject, all the, all the possible registers of the subject, right? So that would be maybe j equals 1 to you know, subject length minus query length or some, something like that. Don't, don't, don't worry you know, too much about this. And again, this is, this is not real code, obviously. It's pseudo code. So then this will be, say, 1 to query length. And so this will be now going along our diagonal. Okay, and we're going to plot the cumulative score. Okay, let's just, you know, so here you would, you would have an update where cumulative score plus equals um, the score of query position i matched against data subject position j, right? I'm going to update that. So that's just cumulative score. So what will it look like? So in this case, um, I'll just use this down here. Um, actually, maybe I'll do it. Um, yeah. So we have 0, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2. OK, so you'll start at 0, at position 0 in the sequence. Okay? And here, at position 1, you're down here at minus 1, right? Because it was a mismatch. Then at position 2, as you said, we're back up to 0. Right? And then what happens? Go down to minus 1, down to minus 2. Then we go up three times in a row until we're up here to, um, to 1. And then we go down after that. Right? So where is your highest scoring match in this cumulative score plot? We said, people said it was from 5 to 7. Uh, yeah. So would it be from like a local minimum to a local maximum? Yeah, exactly. So, so what do you want to keep track of? Um, you want to keep track of the minimum and the maximum and look for the range at which um, you maximize the difference between the two. Yeah, yeah. So that, this is now sort of more what I was looking for in terms of, so this was the local minimum and that's the, the local maximum. This is the score. That's your max S there, right? Um, and you also want to keep track of where, where that happened in both the query and the subject. Does that make sense? So you, would, you keep track of this running cumulative score variable. You keep track of the, the last mi minimum, OK? The, the, minimum, the, the minimum that you've achieved so far, OK? And And so that would then be down here to minus 2. And then when your cumulative score got up to plus 1, you always take that cumulative score minus the last minimum cumulative score. That gives you a potential you know, a candidate for a high-scoring segment. And if that is bigger than your current max high-scoring segment, then you, you update it. And you would update this. And then you would also have variables that would store where you, know, where you are and also where did that last minimum occur. So I'm not spelling it all out. I'm not going to give you all the variables. But this is an algorithm that would find the maximum score. Uh, yeah, a uh, question? So you're keeping track of the global maximum and local minimum minima so that you can access the most recent local minima following the global maximum. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I got all that. But you're, you're keeping track of the cumulative score, OK? Yeah. The last, uh, the minimum that that cumulative score ever, ever got to, OK? And the, and the, and the maximum like difference, the maximum uh, that you ever in the past have gone up, you know, where you've had a net uh, increment upwards. Okay? So like, like here, so this, this variable here, this max s, it would be initialized to zero. When you got to here, your, minimum, your last minimum score would be minus one. Your cumulative score would be zero. You would take the difference of those, and you'd be like, oh, I've got a, I've got a high scoring segment of, of score one, so I'm going to update that. So now 
that variable is now one at this point. Okay. Then you're going down, so you're not you're not getting anything. Uh, you're just lowering this minimum cumulative score down to minus two here. And then when you get to here, it's this. Uh, now you check the cumulative score minus the last minimum. It's one. That's a tie, right? We won't keep track of ties. Um, now at here, that difference is two. So now we've got a new a new record, right? So now we update this maximum score to two and the locations. And then when we get here. Now it's three, and we update that. Does that make sense? So it's. Going down to negative one, it went down to negative three. Negative now, three? Yeah, that, okay. first, that first dip. Now, you mean right here? So we started like back a little bit. So back here, like this? No. No. Down to negative three? No. Yeah, but how do we get to negative three? Because our scoring is this one. You want, you want this dip to minus three? Or wh which? No. This, this one to minus three. Imagine we were at minus three here? Yeah, imagine it okay. dips to minus three. Yeah. And then the next one dipped to higher than that, to minus two. Yeah. And then it went up to one. That, so the, okay, would the gotcha. difference you look at be negative two to one or negative three to one? Like that, yeah. right? Okay. So minus three, let's say, minus two, one, something like that. Yeah. What do people think? Anyone want to? Minus three to one. Minus three to one. It's the, it's the minimum that you ever got to. This, this, is a, this might be a stronger match, but this is a higher scoring match. And we said higher, we want higher scoring. That's our, so you would count that. Then you keep track of the global minimum and the current cumulative score, and you take the difference. It's not necessarily global maximum, it's, it, because it could be, we could be well below zero here, right? We could do like this. From here to here, so this is not the global maximum, right? This is just happens to be, a, a, we, we went up a lot since our last minimum, so that's, that's your high scoring site. Does that, that make sense? Okay, so th this is, um, I mean, I haven't completely spelled it out, but I think given uh, you guys have given enough ideas here that they're sort of the core of an algorithm. And, and uh, I encourage you to think this through um, afterwards and let me know if there are questions, okay? And we might, um, we, could, we could add like an optional homework where they you don't know, ask you to do this that we've sometimes had in the past. Um, it is a useful thing to, to look at. This is not exactly how the BLAST algorithm works. It uses some tricks for, fa you know, for faster speed. But this is sort of morally equivalent to BLAST in the sense that it, it has the same order, order of magnitude uh, running time. Okay? So this algorithm, what is, the running, what is the running time in big O notation? So just for those who are non-CS people, uh, when you use this big O notation, then you're asking how does the running time increase in the size of the input? Um, and so what is the input? So we have two inputs. We have a query um, of length m, let's say, a subject of length n. So clearly, if those are bigger, it'll take longer to run. But, but when you compare different algorithms, you want to know how the runtime depends on those lengths. Um, yes, uh, what's your name? Uh, Sally. Yeah, Sally. And, and time then. OK, so, the, so it, this, this is what you call an order mn. Um, algorithm and why is that? How can you see that? Okay. Right. You're going to go through the query in that. Oops. In the second for loop here, you're going through the query, um, and you're doing that in, nested inside of a for loop that's basically the length of the of the subject. And you're going to have to eventually you're going to have to compare every base in the query to every base in the, in the subject. There's no way around that, and that takes a, you know some unit of time. And so the actual time will be proportional to that. So the bigger m gets and n gets, uh, it's just proportional to the product. Okay, does that does that make sense? Or another way to think about it is like you're clearly you're going to have to do something on this diagonal, and then you're going to have to do something on this diagonal, and this one, and this one, and actually you have to also check th these ones here, um, and in the end, that the total you know, number of computations there is going to be this times that. It's, you're basically doing sort of a rectangle's worth of computations. Does 
that, does that make sense? So that's not bad, right? It's, I mean, it could be, it could be worse. Um, could be like, you know, mn squared or something like that. So, um, it's, so that, that's basically why, why blast is fast. Okay. So what do these things look like in general? And what is the condition on our score for this algorithm to work? Like, what if I gave a score of plus one for a match and zero for a mismatch? Could we do this? Um, Joe, you're shaking your head. Uh, it would just keep going up. It, yeah, what was, the problem is, you know, it would be flat, it might be flat for a while, but it, eventually it would go up, and it would just go up and up and up. And so your, your highest scoring segment would most of the time be something that started very near the beginning and <laughs> ended very near the end, and, you know, right? So that, that doesn't work. So you have to have a, a net negative drift. And the way that's formalized is the expected score has to be negative. Okay. So why is the expected score negative in this scoring system that has plus one for a match and minus one for a mismatch? Why does that work? Yeah. You have a mismatch three quarters of the time. So on average, you, you, you tend to drift down. Okay. And then you have these little excursions upwards. And those are your high scoring segments. All right, any, uh, any questions about that? Yeah. It's Alan. Uh, we got some computer scientists here, uh, David. <laughs> and better than m times n? I don't think so, because you, you have to do all those comparisons a certain way around that. So I, yeah, I don't think so. All right. But, you can, but the constant, you know, you can do better on the constant than this algorithm, I think. So. With oh, multiple queries, yeah, then you can maybe do some hashing or find some, yeah, to speed it up. Okay, all right. Uh, so, okay, so how we, what about the statistics uh, of this? So it turns out that um, Carlin and Altschul uh, developed uh, some theory for just, just exactly this problem for searching a query sequence. It can be nucleotide or protein as, as long as you have um, integer scores and the average or the expected score uh, is negative, then this theory tells you how often you'll see, how often the highest score of all across the entire you know, um, query database comparison uh, exceeds a cutoff x, okay, using a local alignment algorithm such as, uh, <coughs> such as BLAST. And it turns out that the, um, these scores follow what's called an extreme value or a gumbel distribution, okay, and it has this kind of double exponential form here where, so, so x is some cutoff. So usually x would be the score that you actually observed when you, you know, when you searched your query against the database. That's the one you, you care about. And then you want to know what's the probability we would have seen something higher than that, okay? Or you might do x is one less than the score you observed, right? So that what's the score, what's the chance we observe something the same, you know, as good as this or, or better. Does that make sense? And so this is going to be your, your p-value then. Uh, so the probability that S, uh, the score of the highest segment under a model where you had random query against random database of the same length is 1 minus e to the minus kmn e to the minus lambda x, okay? Where m and n are the lengths of the query and the database. Um, x is the score. Um, and then k and lambda are two positive parameters that depend actually on the, the, the details of your score matrix and uh, your, the composition of your, of your sequences. And it turns out that lambda is really the one that matters. Okay? And you can see that because lambda is up there in that exponent multiplying x. Okay? So if you double lambda, that'll have a big effect on, uh, on the answer. Okay? And k turns out you can mostly ignore it for most, uh, most purposes. Okay? So that's, that's a formula. What is this thing? look like? It looks like that, okay? Kind of a funny shape. It sort of looks like a normal for a little bit, but then has, you know, a different shape on the right than, than the left. Um, and how do you calculate this lambda? So I said that lambda is sort of the, the, the key to all this um, because of its, uh, you know, sort of unique, uniquely important uh, place in, you know, in that uh, in, in that formula, multiplying uh, the score. So it turns out that lambda is the unique positive solution to this equation here. Okay, so now uh, it actually depends on 
the scoring matrix, so you see there's SIJ there. It depends on the composition of your query, that's the PIs, the composition of your subject, that's the R, RJs, okay? Um, you sum over the, you know, I and J equal to each of the four nucleotides, okay? And that sum has to be one. So there's a unique positive solution uh, to this equation, okay? So how would we solve an equation like this? So first of all, what kind of equation is this? Given that, like, the PI, we're going to set the SIJ, and we're going to just measure the, the PI and the R, RJ, right? So we, those are all known constants, and lambda is what we're trying to solve for here. So what kind of an equation is this in lambda? Linear, quadratic, hyperbolic, any, anyone know what this is? Okay, so this is called a transcendental equation because uh, you have different, like lambda appears, in, like you have different, different powers. Okay. All right, so those, you know, that sounds like kind of unpleasant, right? Um, you don't hear, you don't take a class in transcendental <coughs> equations probably. So, so um, yeah, in general they're, they're um, uh, not possible to solve analytically when, you, you know, when, they get, when they get complicated, but in simple cases, you can solve them analytically. And in fact, uh, let's just do, let's just do one, okay? So let's take the simplest case, which would be that all the PIs are a quarter, all the RIs are a quarter, and we'll use the scoring system that we came up with before, where SII is one, and SIJ is minus one if, if I not equal J. And so when we plug those in to that sum there, what do we get? Okay. We'll get four terms that are one quarter times one quarter times e to the lambda, right? These are the match. There's, there's four, four, four possible types of matches, right? Um, they have probability one quarter times a quarter. That's pi and rj. Um, and the e to the lambda is... SII is just e to the lambda, right, because SII is one, and then there's 12 terms that are uh, one quarter, one quarter e to the minus lambda, okay, because there's the, the minus one score, and that has to equal one, okay? So, you know, we'll cancel this, we'll like multiply through by four, maybe, so now we get e to the lambda, um, plus three, e to the minus lambda equals one. Okay, it's still a transcendental equation, but it looks, it's looking a little simpler. Any ideas how to solve this for lambda? Sally? Wait, what is the one before? Oh, I'm sorry, four, thank you. Uh, yeah, what's your name? Okay, so the claim is this is basically a quadratic equation. So you multiply both sides by e to the lambda, so then you get e to the two lambda um, plus three, and then it's gonna move this over and do minus four e to the lambda equals zero, right? Is that good? Um, so it's quadratic, how is it quadratic? What do you actually do to solve this? Yeah, change of variable x equals e to the lambda, and then it's quadratic in x. Solve for x. We all know how to solve quadratic equations and then substitute back for lambda. Okay? Everyone got that? Yeah. So, it, so this equation in general, if you use arbitrarily complex, if you use 16 different scores to represent all the different types of matches and mismatches, the, the, this will be very unpleasant. And uh, it's not unsolvable. It's just you have to use um, computational you know, methods, numerical methods to, to solve it. But in simple cases where you just have a couple different types of scores, it will often be a quadratic equation. Okay? All right. So let's suppose that we have a particular scoring system, particular PIs, RJs, and we have a value of lambda that satisfies those. So we've solved, we solve this quadratic equation for lambda. I think we get lambda equals natural log three, um, something like that. Remember, it's the unique positive solution. Quadratic equations have two solutions, but there's gonna be just one positive one. And then uh, we have, so that's, we have that value. It satisfies uh, this equation. 
So then what if we double the scores? Okay, instead of plus one, minus one, we use plus two, minus two. What would then happen? Okay? You can see that the original version of lambda wouldn't necessarily still satisfy this equation. But if you think about it a little bit, you can figure out what new version, new value of lambda would satisfy this equation. I'm going to double the score. Okay, we, we solve for the lambda that solves the, with, with these scores, okay? Now we're going to have, and this was with, uh, now we're going to have new scores, SII prime equals 2, SIJ prime equals minus 2. Um, what is lambda prime, the lambda that goes with these scores? Yeah, what's it? Go ahead. I'm sorry, ha half of the original. Right, so you're saying that lambda prime equals lambda over 2, and why is that? Can you explain? Yeah, if you think about the, these terms in the sum, um, the score, the s part is all doubling, so if you cut the lambda part in half, it will, the product will equal what it did before, right? And we haven't changed the pi's and rj's, so all those terms will be the same. So therefore, it will still satisfy that equation. So that, that's another way of thinking about it. Yes, I mean, you, you're correct. So if you double the scores, lambda will be reduced by a factor of two, okay? So what does that tell us about lambda? Like, what, what is it? What is its meaning? Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. It basically scales the, the, the scores. Okay. So that we have one, we can have the same equation here, you know, in, with, used with arbitrary scoring system. It, it just scales it. And you can see the way it appears as a multiplicative factor in front of the score. So if you double all the scores, okay, will that change what the highest scoring segment is? No, it won't change it, right? Because you'll, you'll have this cumulative thing. It'll, it'll, it just changes what the, you know, how you label the y-axis, right? Or it'll like make it bigger, but it won't change what that, what that is, right? And, it, and if you look at this equation, it won't change the statistical significance, okay? The x will, will double in value, right? Because all the matches are now worth twice as much as what they were before. Um, but lambda will be half as big, and so the product will be the same, and therefore the final probability will be the same, okay? So it's just, it's just a scaling factor for using different scoring systems. Everyone got that? Okay. Um, all right, so what scoring matrix should we use for DNA? How about this one? Okay, so this is now a slight generalization. So we're going to keep one for the matches. There's no point, you know, you, you don't lose any generality by choosing one here for matches because, you know, if you use two, then it's just going to, you know, it's just going to change, you know, lambda is just going to be reduced uh, to compensate, right? So one for matches, and then we're going to use M for mismatches, and M must be negative in order to satisfy this, this condition, right, for this theory to work, that the average score has to be negative, right? Clearly, you have to have some negative, some negative scores, right? And the question then is, should we use minus one like we used before, or should we use like minus two or, or minus five or, or something else? Any, uh, any thoughts on this? Or does it matter? Maybe it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, what's your name? Yeah, okay. So you want to use a more complicated scoring system where, and what particular mismatches would you want to penalize more and less? Yeah, you're, you're correct in your intuition. Um, maybe one of the biologists want to offer a suggestion here? Yeah, go ahead. So, like the mismatch Okay, okay, so now we've got purines and pyrimidines. So, everyone remember the purines are, are um, A and G. The, 
um, the pyrimidines are C and T. And the idea is that um, this should be penalized, or, or this should be penalized less than changing a purine to a pyrimidine. Right? And why, why does that make sense? Structurally, they're more, yeah, purines are more similar to each other than they are to pyrimidines. And more importantly, I think, in evolution, I'm, I'm sorry, can you speak up? Yes, so C to C mutations happen, yeah, uh, spontaneously. Right. So basically, um, it's easier, because, because they look more similar structurally, the DNA polymerase is more likely to make a mistake and substitute, you know, another purine. And yeah, and so so these these do, the ratio of, the rate of purine purine substitutions to pyrimidine pyrimidine uh, to um, I'm sorry, purine purine or pyrimidine pyrimidine to, you know, transversions which which switch the, the type is about like three to one or two to one in different in different systems. So yeah, the, the, that's a good idea. But but for simplicity, just to keep the math simple, we're just going to go with one mismatch penalty. Okay, but th this is a good point in practice. You might want to might want to do that. Okay, so now I'm saying I'm going to limit you to one mismatch penalty, but I'm going to let you choose any value you want. So what value should you choose, or does it matter? Or maybe different applications. Uh, Tim. Yeah. Right. 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 No, that's a good point. You can't make it too too weak, right? Um, you, it it may depend on what your expected fraction of matches is, right? Which actually depends on pi and ri, right? So if you have if you have very biased sequences, like very at rich, your rate your expected fraction of matches is actually higher, right? When you're searching an at rich sequence against another at rich sequence, it's actually higher than a quarter, right? So you might need to, like even minus one might not be sufficient there. You might need to go down more negative. So you may need to use a higher negative value to, just to make sure that the expected value is negative. That, that, that's true. Um, and it, yeah, you, you may want to adjust it based on the, on the composition. Okay. All right, so let's just do a little bit more. Um, so it turns out that the um, Carlin and Altschul theory, in addition to telling you what the p-value is of your match, the statistical significance, it also tells you what the matches will look like in terms of what fraction of identity they will have. Okay? And this is the so-called target frequency equation. Okay, so the, the theory says that if I search a query with one particular composition, P, subject, another composition, R, here I've just assumed they're the same, like both P, just for simplicity, um, with a scoring matrix Sij, which has a corresponding value of lambda, then when I take those very high scoring matches, the ones that exceed, you know, that are statistically significant, and I look at those alignments of those matches, um, I will get uh, values QIJ given by this formula. So look at the formula. So it's QIJ, so PIPJ e to the lambda SIJ. So it's basically the expected chance that you would have PI matching to, or bases I, base I matching base J just by chance, that's PIPJ. Uh, but then weighted by e to the lambda sij. So you notice for a match, lambda will be, s will be positive, so e to the lambda will be positive, so that will be bigger than one, and it, you'll have more matches, right? And you have correspondingly less mismatches because the mismatch has a, has a negative. Okay, so get this target value score. And that also tells you that the so called natural scores um, are actually determined by the fraction of matches that you want in your high scoring segments. You just, if we want, 90% matches, we just set QII to be 0.9, okay, and use this equation here um, for um, S, uh, solve, for, solve for SIJ, okay? So um, there's, um, okay, so if you want to, for example, if you want to find regions with R percent identities, um, you know, little r is just the, the R as a proportion. QII is going to be R over 4. This assumes, you know, unbiased base composition, right? A quarter of the matches are A, C, G, T. Um, QIJ then is 1 minus R over 12. 1 minus R is a fraction of non-matching positions. There are 12 different types. Okay? Um, 
set SII to equal to one. That's what we said we normally do. And then you do a little bit of algebra here. Um, M is SIJ, okay, and you sort of plug in this equation uh, twice here, um, and you get uh, this equation. So it says that M equals log of you know, four, one minus R over three over log four R. Okay. And for this to be true, you have to, this assumes that both the query and the database have uniform composition of a quarter, and that R is between a quarter and one, right? I mean, it, the, the proportion of matches in your high scoring segment, you want it to be bigger than a quarter, right? A quarter is what you would see by chance. So that, that you know, there's something wrong with your scoring system if you're considering those to be uh, significant. So it's something above 25%, okay? And so um, just plugging in, so this is, it's just simple algebra. You can, you know, check, check my work at home um, uh, to solve for, uh, for M here. And then this um, equation then tells you that if I want to find 75% identical matches in a nucleotide search, I should use a mismatch penalty of minus one. And if I want 99% identical um, matches, I should use a penalty of minus three. Okay? Not minus five, but minus three. Um, and we will, um, I want you to think about, like, does that make sense? Uh, does that not make sense? And um, because I'm going to ask you at the beginning of class uh, on Tuesday to like explain uh, and comment on this particular um, th this particular phenomenon of how you when you want higher percent identities you want a more negative um, mismatch score. Okay. All right. Any uh, any last questions, comments?